This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group, the specialists in high risk and challenging filming and time lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction, and infrastructure projects nationwide. And we're live. Welcome to this week's for Linear Abbey. On the show this week, we have Karen. Karen comes highly recommended from our friend Neil Fisher, who is an enigma in safety. He's read more books than I've had for dinners, which is quite a few. And he's really, really interested in some of the stuff that he found in Karen's book, which I'm sure we'll touch on further on in the podcast. So, Karen, if you want to just come in and introduce yourself. Certainly will. My name is Karen Hewitt and I am a freelance consultant in health and safety leadership and engagement and more recently author of the book People Power Transform Your Business in the Era of Safety and Wellbeing. Thank you very much. Okay so I don't know if you've seen the pod before I'd like to just go right back to the beginning talk a little bit about your early background where you grew up and your school years. Okay, so we're talking early. I've got yep. to think back now. Okay, um, so when I was a child, I was really, really shy. I loved animals. Um, I used to, I wanted to be a vet for a while, and I used to drive my mum mad because I used to pick up all these creatures off the road and bring them home. You know, where cars had sort of almost run over baby hedgehogs and little birds had fallen out of their nests and squirrels had been half run over. I used to pick them up in little boxes, bring them home and take them and put them in my mum's airing cupboard. And um, probably shows how old I am, but my mum had this airing cupboard where you had a lagging jacket on top of it and everything, anything you wanted to warm up, you would stick in this airing cupboard. We used to put the clothes on there. So every time my mum went in this airing cupboard, she used to find these, some bird in there or a, an animal, a hedgehog or something, and um, which wouldn't have been so bad if it was just the creatures themselves. But of course they all had fleas as well. So these fleas used to jump around the house. <laughs> so um, yeah, my mum used to go a bit crazy over that. And I was just mad about dogs, guinea pigs, rabbits, anything creature, horses. Had a horse throughout my teenage years and did a lot of show jumping. Was also an athlete, quite serious about running. Um, so through my school, I guess I was very sporty and very studious and very shy. So um, I just used to get on with my studies, do my sports, did a lot of running in the evening, used to ride my horse on the weekend. And um, it was just very shy at school. All my school reports used to say, Karen must speak out more in class, which is um, funny really now as I find myself an advocate of speaking out. And I was never the one that could do it at school. So really shy. Um, so I loved languages as well. So for my A-levels, I did French, German and maths and then went on to university to study French and management science. I wanted to do German as well, but I was advised it was better to have something more vocational. So I did management science with, with French. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, that was me really. That took me from childhood into just about adulthood yeah so what was your first job then leaving education and going going into the workforce yeah so when I graduated there weren't a lot of jobs around and I decided to go gallivanting around the world so I bought a round the world ticket and went with my friends and did um started out one of those round the world tickets that you you had a really good value at the time definitely pre-covid yep. um just to think about it now that you could do that so I went, so I had a year abroad um, that actually turned into nearly two years, a year of which was in Australia. Okay. And when I finally came back, um, there weren't a lot of jobs around. So I got myself a job selling advertising space on a shipping magazine. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about shipping and also a lot about building relationships with people. Yeah. Because to sell advertising space, what I realized it's not, it's often not about the product that you're selling. It's about how much people trust you, how much you can earn their respect and how well you can connect with them. 
and I managed to connect with them through my languages um, because I taught myself Spanish as well. Um, so I managed to pick my German back up, taught myself Spanish. So I found that where I could connect with people in these different languages, I could sell to them. Yeah. Whereas people that only had English couldn't do that. So I found myself with a bit of an advantage doing telesales. And um, I honestly believe it's the best experience I've ever had. And I would say to anyone, do a stint in telesales because it will be the making of you. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. And everything we do in life when we're out in the workforce, especially in safety, we're always selling an idea. That's the top, the bottom of it. You have to be a good salesperson to be able to sell that idea. And the idea that you're selling is that we should have a safe workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Everything we're doing is selling. We're selling right now. That's scary. We are. We're selling. <laughs> And then the idea of this this podcast. Um, so yeah, it took me a long time to realise that. I guess I started to realise it in my early twenties um, because I had a couple of um, instances where people told me I didn't have enough enough of a personality to be successful. So I really hope there's nobody looking at me now thinking she has no personality because that will come back to haunt me. Because I was told this. I wanted to be, as well as wanting to be a vet, I wanted to be a dancer in the Royal Ballet School when I was younger. And I got told that I didn't smile enough. Um, my teacher told me that at about age 11. And then, and you can't just turn that on when you're 11 years old. And then when I was about 21, I went for a graduate job and had one of those assessment centers where they put you in a group, give you a big problem to solve and that everybody watches you, their eyes are on you to see if you've got leadership potential. And at the end, they told me I hadn't got the job because I didn't have the personality for it. So it's twice I, I kind of got told that. Um, but, um, and I guess I made a bit of a decision to try and learn. I, I guess at, at the time I thought it was about learning to be an extrovert, but looking mm -hmm. back, it was learning how to connect with people, how to influence people even if you didn't feel it inside. So I did a lot of work in that area. You know, I delivered conference papers. Um, so as I went into um, sort of advertising space and into shipping, um, I delivered conference papers when I was young. Um, I did a stint lecturing in strategy at a university. So I was up speaking in front of people. I remember even now I was 28 um, teaching strategy at a university and I was mistaken for a student many times <laughs> um, so I was trying my best to sort of put myself out there even though I felt sort of really scared inside but a lot of what I've done before I came to health and safety I think has, has been about connecting with people yeah definitely you mentioned there in early education as well that you had a teacher that was quite disparaging it took me back to a, a memory that I had of a teacher telling me you know, look in construction, and I saw him um, probably about five or six years ago in a pub in Glasgow. And I said, Do you Remember, you told me I've never worked in construction. I worked in the biggest construction project in Europe. How do you like them apples? <laughs> yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Sometimes you have these moments when you have these bits of success in your life and you look back and think, Ah, uh, that person that didn't believe in me, what would they be saying right now? It um, yeah. does make you feel good. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So how did you end up moving from selling advertising and teaching strategy at a university and then into the wonderful world of health and safety? Where was the bridge? Well, that's such a long story that I'm not sure even I can remember it. And it might be <laughs> too long for this podcast because I'm, I, I'm actually quite old. Um, but I'll, I'll see if I can make the link. So after the, the teaching strategy, I did my MBA. And then I sort of my MBA had a marketing pathway and I got sort of more into communications. Mm -hmm. um, I set up my own communications agency with my brother. Um, and we did really well at that and then found ourselves more in demand for our niche skills me, it was my languages and him, it was his sort of internal communication skills. So we went our own way, our own ways. And um, I had, I guess, had a bit of a midlife crisis when you sort of tend to follow your heart. Mm -hmm. And if I look back now, I would say everyone to just follow their heart anytime. But 
I think when you're younger, you tend to do maybe what you think is the best thing to do, what's the right thing to do, what other people want you to do. And then you have this moment where you just follow your heart. And I decided to train as a, an interpreter, a simultaneous interpreter. I decided I really wanted to use my languages. Mm-hmm. Um, so I spent a year training as a simultaneous interpreter. Um, at the same time, I kept my marketing business going just to sort of finance me, um, this communications agency that I had. Um, so I trained as an interpreter and then found out that I could apply to get into the United Nations or the EU as an interpreter. Um, Mm -hmm. The odds were very low, only 1% of people that try get in and you get three goes. And -hmm. after that, you get no more chances. And it took me three goes to get into the UN as an accredited interpreter. Mm -hmm. And after that huge achievement, I discovered after six months, I wasn't enjoying it very much. And in the background, I was sort of career juggling because while I was going, you imagine it took me um, probably about a year, a year and a half to do those three attempts to get into the UN. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, this is where the health and safety link comes in in case you're losing the will to live there. There is a health and safety link. (laughs) Here comes the health and safety link. Um, So, the, the health and safety link was um, somebody that was a, um, a client of mine when I worked in communications. Um, there's somebody who I work with had a client in the oil and gas industry that was looking for somebody to deliver training, travel mm-hmm. the world, speak lots of languages, was really good at communications. So they put me forward. So I ended up juggling, juggling that part time. So one week I would be in Vienna doing um, interpreting and the next Mm -hmm. week I would be somewhere else in the world delivering health and safety leadership training. Yep. And the environments were very different. Um, In the interpreting environment, I felt I was, it was a very critical environment. People were very fond of telling me what I did wrong. Mm -hmm. But in the health and safety environment, I felt, through the leadership training, I was able to really empower people and inspire them. Yep. So it made me feel good. Mm -hmm. So it made me feel good about myself and I discovered I can make other people feel good as well. So that was my sort of aha moment. So I left the interpreting, went full steam into the health and safety um, job. I was there at the oil and gas company for eight years, working my way up, learning about behavioural safety, mm-hmm. safety leadership, got myself qualified in health and safety, got my NEBOSH certificate, um, got myself trained as a coach as well, got myself trained in neurolinguistic programming, yep. launched a coaching program. So really, I was very lucky in that company. They invested a lot in health and safety in doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And then, so that's how I got into health and safety. Excellent, excellent. And that's that's quite a transition there as well. So going from the UN as an interpreter through into oil and gas and travelling the world, it sounds like the role was absolutely made for you as well, speaking loads of languages and doing loads of coaching. So fantastic. So just walk us through your career from there then. Where did it go after that? Okay, so after that... um. I guess I've had two defining moments. I left that company when I went into a merger situation, Mm -hmm. um, which really left me, um, I guess, with with not the role I wanted. So I decided to leave at that time. um, And I'd been busy writing a book in the background, actually not the book that I'm talking about today, but I wrote a book on um, employee engagement. And then I was going to, worked for myself as a consultant when I suddenly got offered another role which was designing and delivering a safety culture change program for another big company in facilities management and construction which was twice the size so 80,000 people Mm -hmm. and the idea of doing that building that from scratch and leading that was too much to turn down so I took on that job Mm -hmm. was in that for two and a half years um had a baby in between um so I went back to that role but again found myself in another merger situation 
um, mm -hmm. where things change, you find yourself in a situation where you're not necessarily going to thrive. Um, and I'd started um, while I was was on my maternity leave. I'd started writing another book, mm -hmm. and I just felt it was the right time to write it because COVID. So three months after I had a baby, the lockdown started. That was March last year. And I just felt suddenly I would have the time. Well, I didn't quite realise I wasn't going to have as much time as I thought with a baby and then go back to work. So the whole thing took me about 17 months. But I realised it was the right time to write this book. And what I wrote was a blueprint on how to set up a sustainable health and safety movement in your organisation. So that was the book I wrote called People Power and so that was published in August and I've been working for myself since March, working with two different firms of consultants and also doing work direct with clients. So really living the dream. Excellent, excellent. So tell us a little bit more about the book. You mentioned that it's a blueprint. It is on my reading list to get through. Um, Neil, as I said at the outset, highly recommended it and absolutely raved about it and he's quite a hard critic to please. So I thought, yeah, we definitely need to have Karen on the podcast. So tell us a little bit more about the book. Yeah, that's amazing to hear that he's a hard critic and he raved about it because I've never met Neil and um, we only met through the book and that's been the amazing thing. Um, mm -hmm. So the book, I think... It's called People Power and my whole approach is about people and mm. really it contains a blueprint. It's called Build, Buzz, Bake. It's got three phases, Build, Buzz, Bake. Build is about setting up the foundations. Buzz is about um, how to really um, communicate with impact and Bake mm. is how to bake it into company culture. But the, the real story behind the book, I think, is the amazing people that I got to work with and meet. So... I decided I wanted to have for the 15 chapters, 15 contributors. Mm -hmm. And as I started looking for health and safety directors to contribute to each of the chapters, I discovered that I didn't really know any female health and safety directors. They were all men. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, oh, this gave me a bit of a shake up, but I needed to find some female health and safety directors. So through a friend who um, in recruitment, I, I started to get in touch with some female health and safety directors. And now I've got a full gender balance in the book. So I think eight out of the 15 are female. And I was determined that I wanted the foreword to be, to be written by a female as well. Mm -hmm. And somebody connected me with Louise Hosking. Yeah. Um, so some of these people in the book I knew mm -hmm. and are supporters of mine. Some people just really took a leap of faith and believed in me, believed in what I was writing. And... Um, it was almost a bit of a lockdown project, really. And I, I really felt I needed, I think, as a first time mum in lockdown, I really needed to do something as a team. And so that connected with me with these great people. Um, there were also people that reviewed it. And then mm -hmm. now the book's out there. I've got people that I'd never met in health and safety, never spoken to before. They're writing these wonderful reviews on LinkedIn and I, and I don't know them. And um, it's just connected me with some wonderful people. And it's made me realise I'm, I'm 10 years into working in health and safety. What a bunch of nice people, health and safety people are. And I, I think sometimes we get a hard rap because we're, we're seen as people that are the enforcers and, you know, we're tough on people. But I think that health and safety people are the kindest most generous people I've ever worked with. So for me, that is the story behind the book. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So if we move forward a little bit then, Karen, let's talk a little bit about what advice you would give to someone starting out in safety today. Well, I think um, there's obviously a technical route to take to get your qualifications, um, mm -hmm. but I would say, don't let that hold you back because my route into health and safety was not at all traditional. Yeah. Um, and I found my area of expertise, I found a niche where I can be comfortable and I don't have to be expert in everything. 
Um, I went on and did my some of my technical qualifications. And to be honest, I struggled with the time now or working in this niche to go on and complete the rest of them. But I'd say if you can find a routine, there are so many um, connecting points for health and safety. Um, health and safety touches HR, it touches communications, it touches learning and development. And I see myself as sitting in the middle there and I connect to communications, I connect to HR. I connect to learning and development and and that's what I do in the book as well because to be successful in health and safety you can't just stay in health and safety you have to be able to influence the rest of the organization you need to show the rest of the organization where and how health and safety is relevant so even if you can come into health and safety doing admin or doing training or doing comms or being um in another function or a role, but you're the health and safety representative, find a way in wherever you can find a way in. Or if you, you're in an organization and you wanna get involved in health and safety, just volunteer. Because I've, I've worked with a lot of people that have got involved in health and safety through working with the programs that I've run. And mm -hmm. they've ended up transferring to that function. So there's more than one way in, I would say, if you believe in it, and you're passionate about it and just find your way in somehow yeah definitely definitely so moving forward again a little bit then what's been the biggest challenge that you've faced in your career um well i guess coming into health and safety in my career or health and safety career either or across your entire career or even in health and safety um I guess sometimes being a woman has been a challenge um, in the environments I've worked in. I've worked in um, a lot of male dominated environments mm -hmm. where as a woman, I'd say sometimes, not always, but sometimes you have to really stand your ground. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's not easy. I've had the odd moments where I felt I've really sort of inside, I've been crumbling, but I've really had to stand my ground and it stood me in good stead. And I think, the older you get, the more you can deal with it. So that's been a challenge. Um, but I think things are getting better there. Um, challenging health and safety, probably the same as everyone else in health and safety faces, is the people outside of health and safety don't always see the relevance to them. And you really have to sell health and safety to them. It's a real sales job. Um, so I think, you know, ironically, you asked me about how to get into health and safety, come out of sales and get into health and safety, because, you know, it really, you really have to sell it, make it relevant. And making it relevant and using those sales techniques to really put the information out there to who you're trying to convince and sell your, your ideas to, what's been the kind of key learning that you've taken from that? What really opens opens the conversation up there? I think finding a way to connect with people. And for me, that means um, really just thinking about the people that you want to connect with and trying to put themselves in your shoes. For example, I've delivered training to frontline workers um, in a manufacturing site, workers that come off a ship. And at first sight, you would think I've got nothing in common with them. I've also mm. delivered presentations at board level to an executive board. Um, and for both of those types of communications, I've had to almost imagine I'm one of them. And I've had to mm. think about what, what, are the, what is their biggest challenge? Um, you know, when they turn up at this moment in time to this moment where we're gonna communicate, what's gonna be the thing keeping them awake at night? What, you know, what makes them get out of bed in the morning? Um, what are their biggest challenges? And if I can try and answer those questions and imagine a bit what it would be like to be them, mm -hmm. I can then communicate and connect with them. And it doesn't matter how different we we seem, um, you know, that that's possible. It just, just means taking a bit of extra time to think about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so where can we get the book then? Where, where can you buy it? You can buy it anywhere. It's okay. everywhere. It's in. It's on all good bookstores, wherever you would normally buy a book. It looks like this. 
Yeah, so you can get it anywhere. People power, transform your business in the era of safety and well-being. Also, mm -hmm. uh, online and um, in-person bookstores, you can buy it. You um, can also buy it directly from me. So it's just, it's out there and um, I hope people enjoy it. Excellent. And what's the plan for the future then, Karen? Where are we going next? What are you going to do next? You know what? I wasn't prepared for this question, but in an instant, now you say that to me, I want this book to make a bigger difference. So I want it in French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, which, um, yeah, is going to be difficult. But, you know, I've done some great work out in Brazil and in Latin America, Angola. I'd really love, you know, people in their own mother tongue to be able to enjoy that book. So I've just put that out there to the universe. Um, I hope the universe was listening. Excellent. Might take me a while to deliver on that one. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. I believe in that quite powerfully myself. I get these crazy inspirational ideas and then act upon them and then all this stuff seems to happen round about me. Hence, we've got a podcast sitting here and we're, we're having this conversation. You mentioned earlier on as well that the book was a lockdown project. This was my lockdown project with a, oh, wow. a second baby just arrived and going into this now so it's uh it's really interesting yeah some similarities there but yeah. thank you very much for coming on the show karen i really appreciate your time it's been great talking to you thank you i'm sorry my voice was failing it's just as well the podcast isn't called healthier than your average because i'd have never got on <laughs> brilliant thanks very much thanks blair This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group, the specialists in high-risk and challenging filming and time-lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction and infrastructure projects nationwide.